For now, we are joined by the CEO of Bank of America, Brian Moynihan. Good to have you back here in person. It's great to be here, Margaret. Thank you for having us. Well, the, our last two guests talked about the fact that we came to the edge. What do you think is the financial cost here since America's credit rating is still in question? Well, I've been CEO. We had the one in 11. We had the one in 13. It's not good for the United States to go through this. It's a political process. It's, it's good they came to resolution. It's good it's behind us. And I think that has provided momentary momentum in the markets and allows us to face the real economic issues and real debt level issues ahead of us. Because some of the CEOs of banks have talked about setting up war rooms and doing emergency planning. I mean, how much of an impact is there? Well, it's because it's over. There was an impact. We were doing all that. We were prepared in case uh, you know, the, it didn't come out right. But the good news, it came out right. And you heard your past guests talk about the uh, coming together in the center and voting it through, which is mm -hmm. good. And so now we can move forward. But there's still issues ahead of us, and we can talk about those. Well, do you think that they should get rid of the debt ceiling, as some CEOs have called for? It, it, that's a political question. The end, it, at the end of the day, we need to have a serious discussion about how much debt we can have in this country, how much we could afford, and how it's spent. And that discussion needs to go on. The debt ceiling triggers certain uh, debates around it at certain times. It's it's part of the process of government, and mm -hmm. whether you're Republican or Democrats have to get together and do it. And we have to be careful that we keep the financial stability and strength of the United States paramount, because at the end of the day, if we're not strong, the rest of the world is not going to be strong. Well, let's talk about that strength, um, because the Federal Reserve is predicting a mild recession on the horizon. What are you seeing there in terms of how the consumer is behaving and where we might be seeing any kind of slowdown? So the last time I was here, was it was the end of uh, last year, and we predicted a recession this year. We moved it out. It's basically third quarter this year, fourth quarter this year, into the first quarter, a mild recession. Uh, and unemployment gets up in a high 4% range, um, still very low by historical norms. And that's our core prediction. As you think ahead of it, what's going on now is the impact of the Fed's tightening has had, had its effect. So consumer spending, 22 over 21 by Bank of America consumers, 4 trillion plus a year, mm -hmm. was up 9%. Year to date, it's up about 5%. In the month of May, it was up about 4% over last May. So it's slowing down. That level is more consistent with a 2% growth economy and a 2% inflation economy, not a 4% inflation level economy, 4 to 5 percent. So the Fed is getting the consumer spending level in line. And now you're, we have the jobs report and other things, which send some confusing and ambiguous yeah. messages. But the reality is the, the activity of the consumer is more in line with what the Fed wanted because the rate increases and other aspects have had their effect. Quantitative tightening has had their effect. You just gestured to this, that the prediction of recession keeps getting pushed out. It's basically like economists keep getting surprised by some of the data out there. Is the prediction that going into this presidential election year ahead of us that we will be in the midst of a recession? Yeah, you know, I think we're at the point now with the Fed having uh, tightened as much as it has with the impact of, of the failures of two, two or three banks, which were different than a lot of the banks but failed, the impacts of the uh, Treasury funding has to come forward, the impacts of the environment around us, it, it slowed the economy down. Mm -hmm. The question is, is inflation under control? And yeah. right now, you know, most people are thinking, and like in 1984, when Continental Illinois failed and Volcker, who was fighting mm -hmm. inflation heavy, paused then, that maybe the Fed should yeah. pause and let, let the effects of all this take hold and let's be seen what happens. But yeah. at the end of the day, that has a slight recession, or is a slight recession. We're going to finish this thought on the other side of the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Face the Nation. We're back with the CEO of Bank of America, Brian Moynihan. I want to pick up on something you indicated earlier um, when you said the Fed had accomplished something. You, you said recently the Fed won the war. Is that the war against inflation? Well, the inflation's tipping over, but one of the toughest things for the Federal Reserve is the power of the U.S. consumer. And they were, they were, they were employed, they were earning more money, and they were spending. And what you're seeing is that's tipping down. That's a key component actually getting inflation under control because if people the unemployment's at all-time lows people are getting you know five six seven percent wage increases and on a multi-year above the rate of inflation and a one year not uh, that that creates a hard job for the fed to slow that down because the u.s economy is so consumer-led they they have won that battle they've won that that battle inflation's tipping over but importantly you can see the u.s consumer activity slowing down which then if you project that out ought to bring inflation down to match it 
with one of the impacts of the banking turmoil we just went through, for lack of a better term, we're hearing about credit tightening up. Um, what are you doing to tighten up lending standards? How much harder is it for consumers to come out and borrow money? You know, at Bank of America, we have responsible growth. We've been driving for a decade. We don't really change lending standards that much given d different types of cycle. But just to give you a sense, the consumer uh, credit quality in our industry is very strong. Um, if, uh, most of us are reporting numbers now that are below 2019, which is a multi-decade low in consumer credit costs. So that's good news. Lending has tightened largely because of two factors. Beginning late last year, just the feeling that a recession, every, everybody was predicting a recession and going to recession, mm -hmm. people tend to tighten credit standards, tougher covenants and things like that. And then the second thing is the disruption caused the capacity of lend to come down, which again is the, as they pulled money out of the banking system and onto the, into the Federal Reserve as cash or into the overnight repo facility and deposits have come down, part of the monetary tightening, there's less engine in, in the engine room to lend. And then, so that causes banks to make, be more careful when they lend and who they lend to and how much they lend. And so that's tightened credit standards pretty, pretty dramatically. And it's more expensive to get a mortgage. It's, it's more expensive because rates went up. When, right. when the Fed raises rates, they're trying to slow down borrowing right. cap uh, capacity. And in the most ho you know, housing and autos and things are most rate sensitive, come down the quickest. And then things like mortgage loans, most, you know, 90% of the consumers are locked in the mortgage loan below 5%. So that slows down. And right. so, but home buying and other things kind of bounce around until everybody gets used to rate cycle and then it moves back up. We were in a very low rate cycle for 15 years. And that, that's a little bit what's confusing people. Are you slowing down your hiring right now? Yes, we are. Last May, we hired 3,000 people. This May, we hired 700 people. And that's due to the attrition rate has slowed so much and we need to trim head count. So we'll be down 3,000. Uh, FT this quarter, we don't, we're not making layoffs, we're trying to do it by attrition, but even the attrition slowed to half what it was last year. And when I talk to other companies, mm -hmm. I get the same input. Depends on the industry. If you're trying to get welders in very specific areas, that's, that's a lot of, that's a tough work on the employment side. But yeah. if you're in a general industry, the employment conditions have leveled back out. They're still, yes. still strong for employment, but it leveled out a bit. And that's good news because again, that right. allows the uh, tightening cycle to pause or slow down mm -hmm. as, and let the economy get back under itself. Brian Moynihan, good to have you here in person. We'll be right back. Campaign 2024 got down to business in Iowa this weekend as most of the declared or potential Republican candidates visited the early nominating state. Notably absent, the GOP frontrunner, former President Donald Trump, who was off the trail this weekend. Mm -hmm. Joining us now to discuss are three of our sharpest political reporters, CBS News political correspondent Caitlin Huey Burns, Ed O'Keefe is a senior White House and political correspondent, and Robert Costa is our chief elections and campaigns correspondent. Welcome to you all. Um, I want to start with you on Donald Trump, because we learned from the Department of Justice that they will not be bringing charges against Mike Pence for his classified document that he was mishandling. What do we know about the case against Mr. Trump? Sources with knowledge of the investigation believe that a charging decision in the documents case on the federal level being led by the special counsel is imminent. It could be coming in the next few weeks. In fact, the grand jury might have some activity this week. We hear from sources close to, the, to this investigation. We also hear that the Trump lawyers might be meeting at some point with the Justice Department to talk through where things stand. When will we know, when you say the next few weeks and imminent, um, there is a Republican debate in August. Uh, are we going to know the answer to this before they all take the stage? The investigations, Margaret, over former President Trump, they loom over this entire presidential race. We hear that a charging decision could be made in June on the documents case. The January 6th investigation by the special counsel continues, but that could end up going into 2024 when some of these primaries are unfolding next year. But right before the debate, the thing to pay attention to, a charging decision and a possible indictment in Georgia where Trump is being investigated for pressuring election officials, that could come in early August, just weeks before that first debate in Milwaukee in late August. This is going to be an incredible uh, primary season <laughs> uh, with that. Um, I want to turn to you, Caitlin, because when they take this debate stage, in order to even walk on alongside Mr. Trump or whomever else, uh, there are some parameters that are being set. We know there are at least 10 Republicans who may be on the stage mm -hmm. 
to get up there, they have to agree to endorse whoever the nominee is. Yeah, they're being asked to sign this loyalty pledge. And what's interesting about this field is that when you ask the candidates, will you commit to supporting Donald Trump if he's the nominee, they really won't say. I've interviewed Mike Pence and Tim Scott, and they uh, have not been able to answer that question. On the other hand, Trump hasn't been able to answer that question either. He hasn't said whether he will uh, support the eventual nominee if it's not him or if he will participate in the debates altogether. That mm. still remains kind of a wild card here. He could be advantaged skipping the first debate. He's ahead of the polls, of course. He's the front runner, at least at this point. Uh, but at the same time, if he does skip the debate, that does give his rivals the opportunity to make their case as the alternative without having to stand there and kind of weather the attacks. But that assumes there are attacks, right? I mean, we're listening to some of these speeches out in Iowa, Ed. He was the candidate who loomed large, but his name was not spoken. That's right. And yeah. Chris Christie, who may be jumping in, one of the few who, who does take aim directly at the former president, but he said he's not going to be a hired assassin. That's what he told Politico. Right. Look, there's a, there's a ceiling that he's hitting right now, about 35, 40 percent. Everyone else in this race knows that. And they're focused on that 60% or so that's still out there to be had. Everything is Donald Trump's to lose. I think anyone showing up to an event hosted by somebody else is clearly curious. And, and the idea of all the legal matters he's facing, all the personal issues he's dragged along with him through the years, uh, is on the minds of these voters, especially in Iowa where we were this week. Uh, a lot of them saying, look, if he's ultimately the guy, I'll pull the plug, I'll be there for him. But all this stuff or this baggage, you know, I'm kind of done with it and I'm hoping somebody else rises. And the names we hear, Ron DeSantis, Tim Scott, Nikki Haley are the three that came from voters' voices most frequently when talking about somebody else. Mm -hmm. All of them understand they've got to lay out what they're about, what they would do differently, because um, they're obviously not Donald Trump. And DeSantis, notably, several times over the course of this past week, was asked about Trump or mm -hmm. made inferences to him in his remarks, uh, making it clear that he thinks uh, the party has to move on. He called his attacks juvenile, said that's why he lost voters back in 2020 and why he won't be able to drag them back. I mean, if that's not the argument some other Republican isn't going to make, right. uh, you know, w w what will work to but, convince those Republicans otherwise? But then that question, uh, Robert, is always, does a possible, you know, movement in this case, does an indictment for hypothetical purposes matter here? Um, or is that even what we're talking about at this point? To build on what Caitlin and Ed laid out, there is a real wait and see mentality with so many of these campaigns. They don't want to attack Trump on the investigations. They want to see all of that run its course. But they are starting to not necessarily attack Trump, but take out the scaffold on policy. Mm -hmm. And you can expect Pence, when he gets into the race this week, according to people close to him, to start, to start saying Trump is not conservative enough to be the Republican nominee. And you're also seeing that same type of attack from Governor DeSantis coming at Trump from the right, linking him with Dr. Anthony Fauci, saying the response to the pandemic was too favorable to corporations, too federal in its nature. So this is a different kind of position for Trump to be in, not to be facing questions about his conduct or his character, but about his conservatism. It's fascinating. Caitlin, you um, have been looking very closely at the issue of abortion as this galvanizing political force. Um, President Biden had said that he would set a national standard of access up to the point of viability, which is roughly 24 weeks under Roe versus Wade. But the Republican candidates each has a different answer here, and um, they don't seem to have a unified position on how to handle something that is so politically loaded. Exactly. Well, Republicans right now are caught between a primary electorate that is cheering the overturning of Roe versus Wade and a general electorate, a broader electorate, that has really rejected that decision. We saw that at the ballot box in 2022, and especially in places like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. We saw it earlier this year in Wisconsin. When you talk to Republicans, operatives, and also those on the anti-abortion side, they want want the candidates to be engaging in this issue because they feel like they ceded ground last time around. And so you do have um, groups like Susan B. Anthony List pushing candidates to take a stance on federal abortion restrictions. Mm -hmm. And that has kind of tied these candidates up in knots. I think what changed this week, however, is how the candidates were talking about it in Iowa. Obviously, Iowa is where the evangelical base is. Uh, Governor Kim Reynolds signed a six-week abortion ban there. So you heard Governor DeSantis talking about that. 
Democrat playing up his six-week abortion ban that he signed into law in Florida. That's a play for those voters, and they're more open about it. We also yeah. got a more uh, concrete answer from Donald Trump, who has tried to kind of avoid this altogether, trying to remind voters that he was responsible for overturning. But the federal, but, but the Republican line on this had been it's up to the states. And I thought it was interesting when Nikki mm -hmm. Haley was on this program recently, she said uh, candidates are not being honest when they claim it's possible to get a national law on abortion. And there is some truth to that, right? The idea of you know having 60 senators to pass anything is, is <laughs> unlikely. Um, but it is trying to kind of thread that needle between the primary electorate that you need to come out and support you in a place like Iowa and general electorate, especially women. Also notable that they'll play this issue differently in New Hampshire, Nevada than they do in Iowa and South Carolina. Ed, I have to ask you about the man running for re-election, mm -hmm. President Joe Biden. Yeah. Um, it was a big week for him uh, with this bipartisan deal. But in that speech from the Oval Office, it went quickly from very bipartisan to a bit of a campaign speech. Yeah, let's raise taxes on the uh, exactly on, on the wealthy and uh, and let's remind ourselves of what Republicans were pushing for in that deal that didn't get through. The goal through the end of this year is to just keep him being president, looking presidential. He's got meetings this week with the Danish and British prime ministers. He's going to have some events on the economy. He's meeting with the Kansas City chiefs. All of that sort of checks the box of I'm commander in chief, I'm in charge. Look at the big deal I just got. He'll be raising a lot of money between now and the end of the year. Not a lot of campaigning. That's not because of his age. That's not because of his vigor. It's consistent with what President Obama did back in 2011 and in going into 2012. And they believe if he can raise all that money now, they'll be more than happy to spend it next year. And they want to just sit back and watch Republicans squabble over how many weeks of a ban should there be for abortion, mm -hmm. who's conservative enough, knowing that they should be able to go into those elections next year in the six or seven battleground states and, and hope that they can continue to make the compelling argument. They worry that if it's not Trump, there's a generational argument to be had, which is why you saw Ron DeSantis alongside his wife and young kids so much in recent days, and you'll continue to. Uh, it's also why they got to get the vice president out there a bit more to talk about you know, issues of concern, especially to the base. All right. Uh, this is going to be a very interesting <laughs> campaign season. Thanks. To all of you. It's just starting. It's just it's starting. Just start. But get ready for a busy summer. There's no slow <laughs> summers anymore, news wise. Um, thanks to all of you for joining us. Quick programming note tune in next Sunday for an interview with North Dakota Republican Governor Doug Burgum, who's expected to launch a 2024 presidential bid in the coming days. We'll be right back. We turn now to the war in Ukraine. Ambassador Oksana Markarova joins us for an update. Good morning to you. It's good to have you back with us. Good morning. Always good to be back. I want to ask you about what's happening now, because uh, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said U.S. trained Ukrainian brigades have arrived in Ukraine, and they've been rehearsing, training, and maintaining for weeks. He mentioned the weather has improved. He's describing the conditions for that counteroffensive to potentially begin very soon. What are you expecting in the coming days and weeks? Well, you know, for us, counteroffensive never stopped, to be honest. Since February 24, that's all we were focusing on, how to liberate our land. But of course, with additional trade brigades, with additional equipment, with everything that we're working on now, uh, we are hoping that uh, our commanders... Uh, as soon as they will see the openings, we'll start this, uh, whether it's going to be one or several counteroffensives. But the faster we can liberate all the territory and all our people, of course, the better. So I will not, of course, as uh, you, you heard our president and our commanders, we will not announce anything. We will not. We will see it when the results are there. Uh, but uh, we are expecting to liberate more soon. And your president said, we are ready. Um, Russia, though, throughout the course of the week has been launching uh, missile attacks, including on the capital of Kyiv. Uh, they appear to be testing your air defenses. Um, and I know President Zelensky has said Ukraine needs more Patriot missiles. Are you getting help getting that kind of air defense right now? Well, Is the U.S. doing enough? We are very grateful for everything we are receiving. So it's Patriots, it's NASOMs, it's all other capabilities. But we clearly need more. So what Russians have been doing again, for 466 days now, but also this week, you know, we have seen how daily, several times a day, there were deadly attacks by rockets, but also Shahid drones all, all the time. So uh, it, it's the terror, it's the destruction that it brings, but also it's the, you know, expanding our capabilities that we have now. We definitely need more. 
The Biden administration released another 300 million in military aid. Some of that included drones. Are these surveillance drones? Are these attack drones that the U.S. is giving? It's uh, a range of, of the drones. So, And we need all of them. We need the surveillance. We need the attack drones. We need the kamikaze drones. So there will be different capabilities in the packages. Um, there is an upcoming NATO meeting in July that the president, President Biden, is expected to attend, and Ukraine's entry, possible entry, into the military alliance is a topic there. Do you know what the U.S. is going to promise? Well, we all look forward to the summit. Uh, Ukraine has uh, NATO aspirations, transatlantic aspirations. For some time now. In our hearts, in our constitution, and the majority of people support it. Since 2008, when uh, the first declaration was made that we will be members of NATO, uh, we believe it's time to start discussing uh, some specific steps in that regard. Now, again, as President Zelensky said, we are realists. We understand the uh, uh, limitations that the ongoing war puts to it. But I think at this moment, after this horrible violation of international law, after Russia attacked us completely not provoked when we were not part of NATO, after historic decisions on Finland and uh, Sweden, mm -hmm. uh, it's time for everyone to realize that it's about good versus evil. And we need to be members of NATO as much as NATO needs Ukraine also in order because we have a lot to add to NATO. So yes, we look forward to this forum to discuss this. Your president said he knows this wouldn't happen until after the war is concluded. In other words, the U.S. wouldn't be drawn in directly to this conflict now as a NATO member, but promise a future entry. What are the security guarantees that you are looking for? Well, you know, the President Zelensky put out this peace formula, which clearly outlines how the war should end and how to build, uh, restore the security. So there is a lot of elements. It's, it's the military security, justice, rebuilding, uh, rebuilding Ukraine, uh, ensuring that we can all together deter Russia from making it again. And it's all been discussed with, with partners individually, but also with the group. It was one of the items discussed at the G7 uh, summit at others. So it's a work in progress. But I think, you know, the real security guarantee, not for Ukraine, but for transatlantic community and for our part of the world, but globally for everyone who believes in UN statute, is for us in the future to become the member of the alliance that is a peaceful defensive alliance of the people with like-minded values. $45 billion in U.S. support to Ukraine has been pledged so far, but that funding ends in September and there'll have to be a request for more. Um, are you concerned about all the political pressures that may make that more difficult, particularly going into a presidential election year? Well, any democracy, and Ukraine and the U.S. are both democracies, have uh, good democratic elections and processes. And yes, it's an additional factor. But I believe American people support us. And we're very grateful for American people for the support we have received. We will always uh, remember it. And I know that the majority of politicians on both sides of the aisle, you know, uh, equally, we have this mm -hmm. strong bipartisan support. And I really hope that Ukraine will continue uniting people in Ukraine, even through this electoral process. Ambassador. We'll be watching closely in the coming days and weeks and thinking of Ukraine. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Turning now to rising tensions between the U.S. and China. A Chinese warship came within 150 yards of hitting an American missile destroyer in the Taiwan Strait. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said it was extremely dangerous. China's defense minister called the presence of that American destroyer a provocation to China and defend it, sailing the warship across its path. It's just the latest flare-up in the relationship between the two powers, and it came 34 years since the crackdown in Tiananmen Square, when Beijing brutally quashed peaceful pro-democracy protests by unleashing tanks and troops on demonstrators. The death toll is still unknown, but estimates range from several hundred to several thousand. Seven days after the massacre, then Face the Nation moderator Leslie Stahl briefed Americans on the fallout ahead of a conversation with the U.S. ambassador to China at the time. 
The White House now says the Chinese government has murdered many, many of its own people. Leader Deng Xiaoping and the other hardliners are consolidating their control over the country, searching out, rounding up the pro-democracy yeah. leaders, while Western businesses pack up and begin pulling out of China. Official Chinese television is denying there was ever any bloodbath, any brutality in Tiananmen Square, showing pictures of the arrests of what authorities there are calling thugs and hooligans. Ambassador Lilly, uh, in the morning papers today, there are a lot of stories uh, suggesting that the U.S.-China relationship is tearing apart, is disintegrating rapidly. There's a lot of anti-Americanism in their official press. Uh, what, what's your assessment of where we stand? President Bush keeps saying he wants to preserve the relationship. Uh, how is that possible at this point? I think we've gone through many ups and downs with China, and I think right now we're going through a down, but I don't think we should uh, sort of give up on it. I think that would be a terrible mistake. Those ups and downs continue today. China's defense minister refuses to speak to Secretary Austin, but two top U.S. officials are arriving in Beijing today in an attempt to thaw relations. The visit comes after CIA Director Bill Burns' secret trip to China last month, becoming the most senior Biden administration official to visit Beijing since our relationship with China sharply deteriorated following the February shootdown of Chinese surveillance balloons over American territory. We'll be right back. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching. I'll be off next Sunday, but you will be in great hands with CBS News primetime anchor John Dickerson. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.